I had a physics teacher in high school who used to make jokes about all your base or belong to us while he was teaching. It took me a little while to realize that it wasn't your typical reference class. John Smith is a 50-year-old man. 8 out of 10 50-year-old men live to the age of 61. What are the odds that John Smith will live to the age of 61? John Smith is English. 9 out of 10 English people will be alive 11 years from now. What are the odds that he'll be among them? John Smith has tuberculosis. 2 out of 10 people with tuberculosis will die in the next 11 years. What are the odds that he won't? John Smith is an animal. 99 out of 100 animals die within 11 years of any given point. What are the odds that John Smith isn't one of them? Your estimates for each of these prompts probably vary considerably, but they're all describing the same person and posing the same statistical question. When we're trying to make sensible predictions about a particular something, anything, people, stock prices, pandemics, whatever, we have to fit that individual into a category of similar individuals, a group that shares some essential property, men, vertebrates, humans with tuberculosis, and so on. This allows us to forecast the future behavior of that individual by examining the past behavior of that group, a reference class. Usually, the selection of a reference class doesn't even cause a blip on our mental radar because the right one is self-evident. We know that it's totally crazy to predict whether or not Mr. Smith will die in the next 11 years using data gathered from animals. But every individual has an indefinite number of properties, each of which has the potential to place it in a different reference class with a different history and different probabilities for that individual's future. And sometimes deciding which reference class is the right one is tricky. Without an unambiguous rule for selecting the proper reference classes for our predictions, including predictions about what YouTube video we should watch next, how to spend our money, whatever, the ambiguity of how we end up choosing a representative group seems to undermine our ability to make those predictions in a way that isn't arbitrary in some sense, or maybe even gerrymandered to return the results that we want to see. For example, in 1991, a Nigerian drug mule named Charles Shinubi was arrested for smuggling heroin into the country by swallowing balloons, with further evidence establishing that he had performed similar smuggling runs on seven previous occasions. Federal law required that he be imprisoned for an amount of time proportional to the total quantity of drugs that he had managed to get past airport security. But without a time machine, there was no way to know how much he had smuggled. Thankfully, his prosecutors devised a simple statistical method to estimate that number. Using the quantities of drugs smuggled by 117 other Nigerian drug mules who were caught while Shinobi was operating, they established a normal distribution and from that distribution concluded that there was a 99% chance that he had smuggled between 1,000 and 3,000 grams of heroin. In some ways, this makes perfect sense and is a laudable attempt to establish some sort of fair sentencing criteria without an exact number. In other ways, it's a little horrifying to imagine sentencing someone to some amount of jail time because they belong to a particular reference class. We could use any number of data sets to guess how much heroin Shinubi smuggled in, each giving a different, totally valid conditional probability. For example, Shinubi was a toll collector at the George Washington Bridge, and the distribution of drug smuggling quantities for toll collectors at the George Washington Bridge is practically zero. So why not conclude that he had smuggled zero drugs? There are also uncomfortable ramifications of using reference classes to establish guilt and punishment. Say that we've collected data that shows that 99 out of 100 kids shoplift something without their parents finding out about it. Would you be justified in punishing your kid for shoplifting, sight unseen? After all, they belong to a reference class that would seem to make it 99% certain that they're guilty of the crime. That's more certain than parents could be about most things regarding their kids. But even so, it seems like you'd need something else to assign punishment fairly. Go to your room. What do you mean why? You're a kid. I'm almost certain you did something wrong. Shinubi's case is an excellent example of how choosing reference classes, even in seemingly sensible ways, is fraught with hidden issues and assumptions that don't necessarily hold up to close scrutiny. Obviously, that applies in more domains than criminal justice medicine, economics, insurance, machine learning, engineering, business management. Any field that uses statistics to form predictions of uncertain events 
has to make some judgment call about which groupings of its subject material should be used for analysis. And while the analysis itself might be painstakingly rigorous, that judgment is often based on little more than a fuzzy intuition. Many philosophers, statisticians, and other experts concerned with probability have proposed strategies to rank reference classes according to some reasonable criteria, but it remains a sticky wicket for anyone interested in predicting the future accurately. For that reason, reference class selection is one of the numerous ways that people can tell half-truths using perfectly valid statistics. Maintaining that they're using facts and evidence to reach their conclusions, and implying that anyone who disagrees with them isn't. Because picking out the most pertinent reference class is usually an automatic, unconscious thing, it can be hard to put your finger on exactly what it is about such an argument that doesn't sit well, even though you might agree with the data and its predictions about its chosen subjects. But now that you know about the reference class problem, maybe you'll be a little quicker to distinguish those kinds of disputes, even if there's no real way to resolve them. Where can you see the reference class problem at work? Please leave a comment below and let me know what you think. Thank you very much for watching. Don't forget to follow, subscribe, like, share, and don't stop thinking.